officially call us to order on Gen uh, the uh, Metropolitan Council tab meeting of January 18, 2023. Um, I'll call to order and ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Been moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We have a public invitation. This is an invitation to interested persons to address the transportation advocacy, um, excuse me, transportation advisory board. Um, some of them were allowed to pre-register at public info, uh, metstatemn.us. Uh, Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Is there anybody who showed up for this and wants to speak at this time in the public portion of this meeting? Anyone at all wants to speak? Seeing none, we will move on in the agenda then. Um, the next one is reports. Um, this is the, the tab chair's report. You can see that Jim is out of town today and he's at a conference and asked me to fill in for him today. So we will go into introductions of some of the new tab members and alternates um, may also be here. Um, Anoka County is Julie Jepson. Matt Look is now the alternative. So welcome. Thank you. Nice you, to see you. Yeah, you've seen me here numerous yes. times before because I was... Um, mm -hmm. I was on Blaine City Council, so I was a representative through Blade and now won the commissioner seat. So um, Matt Look was generous enough to allow me to continue my, my role here on this committee. So happy to be here again. We're glad to have you here. Carver County, John Fahey, alternate, replacing Matt Oderman. Well, we'll talk to him the next time. Dakota County, Bill Drosky, alternate, replacing Kathleen Gaylord. These and are alternates. These today. are alternates, yes. okay. So. And I don't see. And then Washington County, Carla Bingham, the alternate replacing Wayne Johnson. So I came as an alternate, but Metro Cities, they're going to be announcing theirs tomorrow. And on the um, MPCA, I believe we'll get a report, and when the report comes out, we'll have an announcement <coughs> during the presentation of who's going to be leading the MPCA here on the board. So appreciate that. Um, Met's council appointments also will be made early February. Also, TAC, um, new TAC chair, Jennifer Hager from Minneapolis. Jennifer, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you. And so um, with that, we will move on to the agency reports. We'll start with MnDOT, Michael Barnes. Um, is Michael here? Or I didn't see him. I guess it's Sheila. Sheila, you're going to be uh, presenting? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I am here for Mike Barnes today for MnDOT. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an agency update. Uh, you know, a few things going on at MnDOT. Most notably, we've got some snow and ice events that have most recently challenged all of us for cleaning roads and cleaning up. So we appreciate the public's patience with us as we, um, you know, once the snow falls, there's much work afterwards that impacts the roadways, whether that's on the roadways we um, oversee or the ones that the cities and counties do. So we, we definitely appreciate the public's um, patience with us on that. Legislative update, we're hoping to have budget authority bill passed for fiscal year 2023 funds for us to be able to use that. Um, it has passed at the House Finance and Policy Committee already. Um, and signs are, um, you know, signs are that it will take a quick vote too. So Senate has not taken the bill up yet. So please, if you see that, lend your support for that opportunity for MnDOT to have the budget authority. Um, you know, traffic fatality deaths, that's one of the things that Mike does report on each month. Uh, where we're sitting at right now with 2023 traffic-related fatalities is the same as what it was in 2022. So we're trending probably in the wrong direction. And later in the agenda, well, there will be some conversation about the safety um, and the non-consent business item too. So we are, we are closely working with our local partners and all those involved that are traveling on the highways to make those safer. Um, and again, we're the other part that we're closely working at with MnDOT is the IIJA funding opportunities. Uh, we did hire a consultant at MnDOT to oversee and proactively look at corridors that may fit in those different um, funding categories. Again, the criteria is slowly coming out and we're trying to be as proactive as we can to be able to identify places where we could apply for funding. Um, as with many of the things we're seeing is 
MPOs, local agencies, nonprofits are able to apply for those grants as well. So we encourage all those that are looking for things to do within their communities and agencies to, to be able to reach out and, and try to apply for funds as well. And Elaine, I will send you the numbers that Mike um, typically sends as well for the TZD efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mac, Bridget. Well, welcome, Bridget. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped NBC. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for having the Airports Commission on your agenda today. Wanted to bring just some general information about where things stand um, with regards to the Airports Commission and our reliever system. This is um, um, basically the same presentation that the full council is going to get next week. Um, so we wanted to offer just some general information. It's been a, quite a while since we've been in front of this group. So um, hoping someone can bring up our yeah, presentation. <laughs> Somebody ran to. Okay. And then we can get started. So um, <clears throat> for those of you who are new and maybe not familiar with the Airports Commission, we are um, a um, system of airports, like I said. Um, we were established to do just that exactly, so we are considered an airport authority. We actually um, have what we think is the largest aviation system in the country um, with our number of airports. And while you will see some of the same types of aircraft at every airport, each airport is unique. Each airport has a different role in the system. Um, and then just for context, there are two airports in the metropolitan area that we actually don't own and operate. Um, so it's quite a... Um, uh, quite a lot going on um, with our um, different uh, facilities and such, and especially with the snow, as we were talking about. So um, just a little bit on our um, pandemic recovery. Wanted to start with that. So March um, marks the three-year anniversary of COVID, right, the start of it. Um, we all want it to be done. We are still coming out of it as an aviation industry. Over $40 billion worth of revenue was lost in the two years um, because of the pandemic. Um, and while revenues are on the rise, and you can see here locally, this is for um, MAC overall. The green bars represent our um, revenues. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were around $400 million a year. Um, and you can see the significant drop in 2020. Um, and this theme, uh, drop-off theme, you'll see consistent through the graphics today. Um, they are coming back at the end of 2022. We're about 85% of our operations and of our revenues compared to where we were in 2019. Um, we're hoping to be about 90% by the end of 2023. And one of the things that I want to um, just acknowledge here with our capital improvement program, so my role at MAC as Vice President of Planning and Development is to develop and implement our capital program. Um, when we look at our finances, we take all of our revenues and then we subtract out our operating expenses, which are shown in orange. Then we take out all of our debt and where our responsibilities are there. And whatever little bit is left trickles its way down to the capital program. So um, in 2023, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in 2020 and 2021, we ended up deferring over $300 million worth of work because of that drop in our revenues from a capital standpoint, which is significant. And um, I expect that you all had the same um, um, issues going on here at Metropolitan Council too. So you can see here, um, again, those um, amounts deferred and how we adjusted our program. In uh, 2022, our capital program for that single year was about $267 million. That's $185 million more than 2021. And it's an indication that, hey folks, we can't defer anymore. We really need to get back into start um, uh, maintaining our assets and keeping up with what um, we need to keep up with. And one of the important things to recognize is that while the federal government continues to feed lots of money into infrastructure, which is awesome, um, only certain projects are eligible for that money. And so we have a lot of uh, campuses and assets that actually don't fit under that eligibility. And those are the kind of projects that we are needing our uh, revenues to come back so that we can fund. 
From a daily departure standpoint, um, <clears throat> again, similar graph, uh, the red line from 2020, <clears throat> showing the significant decrease in operations, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and then the um, uh, gradual uptick in years. And the interesting thing about this graph is, regardless of what number they're at over the course of the year, you can see we always have the same peaks and the same valleys. Um, it's just a matter of how many um, passengers are happen, happen to be. Um, what's happening with our departures is that, yes, they're coming back, but they will continue to be down. And the reason for that is airlines are upgaging again. They're using larger aircraft with more seats to move more people with fewer operations, which is a really good thing because MSP is a constrained site. We do have capacity issues and will, again, at some point in time, but as long as the number of operations stays down, it helps us with that capacity, helps with overall sustainability, helps with the environment, all that good stuff. So again, similar graph. Uh, Implanements are, um, well, I should say just really quick, um, from a departure standpoint, um, we look at, uh, the metric we use is um, seats available. So airlines will make a certain number of seats available. And the first quarter of this year, um, airlines are making about 9% more seats available than the same time period last year. So on the increase, and if you've you know, seen the news, both Delta and Sun Country continue to um, increase um, their uh, business plans and their routes and that kind of thing. Employments are actual passengers that get on the airplane. And prior to the pandemic in February of 2019, our employments were up. Um, almost 9%, and then the bottom fell out to, we fell to 95% below where we were. That's a, it, it, it's, um, it's akin to 9-11 in some ways. Um, and you can see the gradual, gradual increase. And like I said, by the end of this year, hope, or by the end of last year, we're about 85%. End of this year, hopefully to be about 90%. From a uh, routes standpoint, or routes as some people say, <laughs> Um, we had a significant drop off as well. We lost over 100 of our uh, domestic destinations uh, as part of COVID um, for a certain amount of time, and then those are gradually picking up. We're up at 193 right now. Um, of that 193, 150 of those are made up by Delta and Sun Country. So, pretty significant um, foothold from those two hub carriers that we have. From an international standpoint, we uh, were back to 26 of our um, 2019-30 routes that we had. Um, the most recent being the Sun Country Cayman weekly, uh, weekly Saturday flight to Grand Cayman. Um, I was a beneficiary of that a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so I would recommend it. Um, and then uh, Delta just recently also restarted their Seoul, South Korea flight, which is uh, terrific. And then in March, they're planning to restart their Tokyo Haneda flight. So all good things happening from um, an air service standpoint. So from a domestic route standpoint, um, Sun Country and Delta, as we said, continue to um, increase the numbers of locations. Uh, Colorado Springs ex is expected to start this summer from Delta. Uh, both Delta and Sun Country are flying to Destin, Florida. Anybody been to, what's in Destin, Florida? It's in, it's intriguing to me. Beach. <laughs> beach <is white> <laughs> <laughs> like That's what every awesome. town in Florida looks the same, right? So <laughs> just wanting to acknowledge the fact that, that air service is coming back. One of the interesting things, too, during the pandemic is Sun Country had the benefit of an agreement with Amazon where they were flying cargo for Amazon, which... I think really saved the day for them, quite honestly, um, during that time period. Um, and these are some of our international destinations. You can see we're up to 26 now, um, and um, ideally growing as we go forward. Just a quick note about our reliever airport system. Um, so in uh, 2019, we had about 319,000 operations total. That's takeoffs and landings, all six airports combined. Um, in 2021, we were over 352,000. So while things were kind of decreasing big time at MSB, the reliever airports exploded. We saw all kinds of growth in operations at our reliever airports. Flying Cloud out in Eden Prairie is um, and continues to be our busiest reliever airport. There were days in 2020 and 2021 where there were more takeoffs and landings at Flying Cloud than there were at MSP. Oh. <laughs> and that is hard to get my head around. 
Um, so general aviation was doing um, just fine, apparently, uh, during the pandemic. All right, just uh, let's talk about our capital improvement program. So um, as I mentioned, uh, our 2022 program, 267 million, a big piece of that is our ongoing operational improvements program. So I think you've talked about this. I know uh, Commissioner Kermans has talked about some of these stats along the way uh, to kind of keep you updated. This marks the um, seventh year now of phasing for operational improvements. Um, we're not taking this long on, um, because we want to. Um, we're doing such a major renovation of our check-in facilities, our security checkpoints, and our um, baggage handling systems that you just can't take it all down at one time, right? We still have to pass, we still have to process millions and millions of passengers um, per year. So between that and the funding breakdowns, um, we are um, spreading it out quite significantly. 2024 is anticipated to be our last big phase and then a little bit of wrap up after that, but I wanna call it done and we're getting close. $450 million total, um, significant energy improvements, um, significant um, passenger amenities, and like I said, capacity improvements for those check-in processes. Our checkpoints, our south checkpoint, if you haven't been to Terminal 1 south checkpoint, um, is now nine lanes. Um, it used to, it started out as five, it went to six and now it's up to nine. Um, so those are all really good things for our passengers. Although I was there yesterday morning and the lines were crazy. So um, staffing will continue to be um, an issue for airlines, for TSA, for our concessionaires. It's kind of rough all over out there, right? Um, Concourse G, um, who's gotten stuck flying out of G22, right? Farthest gate away from the check-in counters. Um, and um, arguably one of the oldest parts of the of the building in 2020 we had planned and continued forward with an expansion to concourse g we added about 50,000 square feet so if you can picture concourse g is just a very long narrow concourse and then every so often we have what we call pods where there's three gates um, and then at the end we had five gates um, personally big ugly bar kind of in the middle restrooms in the middle um, and about a 1960s feel to it. So this project renovated that entire space. We built new restrooms, we moved um, all of the concessions to new locations and provided much more gatehold space. We built this rotunda space. Uh, we have an artist on board now that's um, in the design process for what the hanging art is gonna be in this particular location. Um, about a $65 million project. Delta is building a Sky Club on top of it, so they will have a third level a Sky Club planned to be open this spring. That'll be the third one um, at, the, at the airport. And between the improvements to the front of the house with the Operation Improvements Program and the improvements in this area, um, our passengers are like, okay, what's, what are you gonna do about the rest of the building? So we're partnering with Delta to move forward with another $200 million or so to upgrade the rest of the concourses to have this same look and feel with new Delta standards and new MAC standards for lighting, um, terrazzo, uh, seats, carpet, all that kind of stuff. And this is just a rendering of what Delta Sky Club is. I've never been in a Delta Sky Club, but this one looks pretty nice. Okay. Um, we are constructing a uh, new fire station on our campus. When we built runway 1735 back in the early 2000s, it came with a requirement for an additional fire station. So we built a new one then. The one that we had um, has been in place since the 1970s. It is well beyond its um, useful life. And that is the fire station that we are replacing with this project. So, I mean, the building was so old, you couldn't even improve it anymore. The systems were so old. So this project, it's about a $40 million project when you include engineering, um, design, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we got started on construction in 2022 this year. Um, it should be complete by the end of this year. And um, then as part of um, the second phase, we will be adding on to this particular structure with our new safety and security center. So that will house a uh, police uh, department. Right now, our our airport police are housed in about 13 different locations across the campus. So we're going to centralize them. Um, our air site operations folks, our emergency communications, um, we'll have an emergency um, operations center in the new building. 
all part of an effort um, that airports are going through to centralize the operational function so that if something were to happen on the airfield or there needed to be response, they're all together in one place and can really enhance that communication. Long-term planning, so we are in the process of um, updating our 20-year facility plan for MSP. Um, we have had a few um, open house type meetings uh, for uh, MSP from the MAC. Um, we're looking at obviously our um, future operations and passenger levels. Um, we are hoping to have a draft available for public review in the uh, spring, early summer. Um, the council is obviously involved with that particular process. And um, we are trying to really focus on the stakeholder engagement piece of it um, to let people um, have the opportunity to come in in a relaxed kind of an atmosphere to learn whatever they want to learn about what we have and what we do in our facilities. A um, couple things to note for long-term planning. So while we're fixing the front of our house and Terminal 1 is going to look awesome and we're continuing to expand on Terminal 2 as part of the previous plan um, that we had in place, um, we still haven't addressed our curbside issues. Um, and you all know we have curbside issues at both of our terminals that we need to fix. Um, we have concourses E and F that are getting old and need to be replaced, and how are we going to manage that? We also have two of our parking ramps are going to reach their end of life within the 20-year facility plan as well. Those are the green and gold ramps closest to the terminal. Prime real estate for maybe something other than parking. I'm not going to lie to you, there will be parking when we put back there, but there may be some other things that make a lot of sense to put there too. Passenger services, uh, customs and border protection, there's all kinds of opportunity um, for that kind of space. Not to mention, we can't do anything with our curbside, quite honestly, until we take down those ramps and, and reorganize, reconfigure what that space at the curb looks like. Um, lastly, I just want to mention, too, for long-term planning, we're also in the process of updating our Flying Cloud long-term plan, um, which um, um, is, uh, it is in its early stages. We have had a couple of public meetings associated with it. We are, uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a uh, state law that limits our runway length for uh, the type of airport that Flying Cloud is. Uh, that airport also has a weight restriction associated with it. We are not planning on messing with any of those things as part of this long-term plan. Um, we are, however, looking at the design aircraft, and per the FAA regulations and standards, some of the safety areas and things change when you upgrade your design aircraft. And the design aircraft gets upgraded when you have enough operations of a certain type of aircraft. So we don't control that, the users control that, um, and we're finding ourselves in a, in a situation where we have to upgrade our standards. And that has some implications for the airfield and stuff that we're working through right now. So that'll come to you probably much later um, this year, um, but we'll also have um, that council involvement with that. And then just lastly, I um, have to note a couple uh, just quick things. Um, this is Brian's part. He likes to talk about this part the most. So um, in September, J.D. Powers ranked us, ranked MSP as the number one uh, airport for the first time ever um, in their mega airports category. So we beat out San Francisco and Miami and a, um, a handful of others, which is awesome. Um, it was not anything that we solicited, so it was kind of fun news to get. And then uh, the Wall Street Journal also named us as the third best hub airport in the US. Um, I'd like to mention too, um, from a customer service standpoint, we had um, four years in a row where we were number one in our airport category for airport service quality. Um, in 2020, we did not compete because we pulled all our surveyors out of the building. We didn't think it was safe for them to be in there talking to passengers during COVID. Um, so we didn't compete. But in 2021, we got that recognition again as number one. So um, all of that is, um, is attributable to our airlines, our tenants, our concessionaires, all doing everything they can to make the travel experience as wonderful as possible for people coming through the building. And so we want to thank you for um, your... Um, for your customers, for, um, for utilizing our facilities, for supporting <coughs> MAC um, over the years with the things that we um, need to do and uh, what we try to provide um, with our facilities and ask that um, if you have ever have any information, you know, keep connected with us. Brian's got the two websites there. The first one is for, the, for MSB specific. The metroairports.org is our MAC site where you'll find our financial statements, you'll find 
our planning documents, our environmental stuff, um, any uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of the airport commission. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Yes, thank you, Bridget. Are there questions or comments folks want to have for Bridget while she's here? I, I didn't um, forget about MPCA, just so you know, but I'm going to go back. Thank you, Bridget, with a couple of housekeeping things. One of us, um, when members, when you make a motion in a second, can you call out your name? If not, I'll try to. Um, Jenna's online. She's a little under the weather, and she's taking minutes that way, and it would be really helpful if you just say that. I would appreciate that. Um, and also, I just was informed that we have another new TAB member that was inadvertently left off this list. Jeff uh, Weisenzell, um appointed November 1st to the meeting. Um, um, is a city rep replacing Gary Hansen. Of course, you moved up. So thank you and welcome. So I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Okay, we'll go back then to the MPCA. All right, thanks, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. A um, couple of quick Morning, things Todd. from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. We do have a new um, assistant commissioner for air and climate who will be the TAB representative. Oh. Now we're still working out. Um, attendance and, and how much he's going to be able to attend. His name's Frank Kolash, and we'll get the complete information uh, to, to Elaine on that. Um, but that was recently named um, as our new Commissioner for Air and Climate. Okay. Um, just one other thing, I always like to tell you when we have money available um, for, for uh, grants, and through our uh, Volkswagen settlement, um, we have level two charging Station grants available right now, about two thirds of a million, uh, two thirds of a million dollars um, for level two charging at public places, workplaces, and multi-unit dwellings. Again, uh, as always, the, the intent here is try to reduce emissions by replacing gas-powered vehicles with electric. And that grant uh, opportunity is open through February 28th. So that more information on that can be found on our website. Okay, that's it. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, uh, Metropolitan Council. Charles, you're in here for Deb Barber. Welcome. I am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, Charles Carlson filling in for Deb Barber as she will be late today. She's assisting with uh, interviews for Metro Transit's next chief of police. So oh. important role and, uh, and glad that's moving forward. Quick update on the governing body of the Met Council. Uh, last week, Governor Walls reappointed Chair Zelli as chair of the Met Council, uh, continuing his service that began in December of 2019. Uh, the governor also appointed, announced appointments to the Met Council nominating committee. Uh, so the 15-member nominating committee recommends candidates uh, for the council to the governor, uh, and that committee will host public meetings to accept statements from or on behalf of uh, the applicants for the positions. I believe there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 applicants for the uh, 16 uh, districts of the council, although it's not uh, evenly spread uh, in terms of you know, the number of applicants per district. Uh, the council chair also serves as a non-voting member of the committee. And of note, there may be other TAB members, but um, Janet, former TAB members, but Janet Williams is a, is a member on the uh, nominating committee, so uh, connection to this body. Uh, so uh, applicants will be selected to be interviewed by the nominating committee, and they they testify at a series of one of four public meetings, and those are uh, January 25th uh, here, uh, January 26th at in Savage, uh, January 30th in Minneapolis, and January 31st in Blaine. And so uh, those would be, serve as kind of the interview process, and then. Uh, the, um, the nominating committee then forwards recommendations on to the governor to consider either those appointments or others. Um, so that would be occurring during February and then presumably sometime in March, uh, the new composition of the, of the council would be announced as uh, appointments by the governor. Uh, and then finally, the council is reviewing candidates for the council-appointed representatives to the TAB, uh, as, as the chair had mentioned earlier, uh, covering uh, citizen member dis districts E, F, G, and H. Uh, so review is underway with anticipated selection in February. And then also in February, the council would appoint the TAB chair. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? We're looking forward to seeing the new Met Council, I think. 
time of transition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, please. Real quick, so how does redistricting <clears throat> figure? Uh, good Into question. This. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Hoberg. So, following the appointment of the council uh, to uh, the to the board, then a redistricting process would occur, and then any um, any issues that arise from redistricting would need to be worked out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? It's a good question. Um, STA, Gary Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a brief update. Um, all suburban transit providers are experiencing slow but consistent growth in uh, express and, and fixed route service, about 50 to 60 percent of pre-pandemic ridership. And um, on-demand service continues to, uh, to grow with, with demand regularly meeting and exceeding capacity. Southwest Transit uh, is purchasing four electric buses and six electric vehicles, which is an item on our consent agenda today. And Southwest is piloting a TNC partnership with Lyft. Uh, MVTA reached one million rides in 2022, uh, a big step toward full recovery, um, and a significant milestone was uh, nearly breaking the, uh, the all-time pre-pandemic state fair ridership record. Plymouth is uh, developing uh, an express route between Brooklyn Center and Minnetonka uh, and other western suburbs. And uh, interagency collaboration continues to, to increase on, on subject matter and uh, training and, and studies. And that is my update. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Oh, please, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have more info on the lift on the partnership? I don't have details, but Mike Wong, do you have information since you're on that board? <laughs> yeah, we're still working through the details on that right now, so we're hopefully going to finalize some of the contract pieces of it. So at this point, we're probably a little bit early to give some of the details out just yet. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the TAC report. Jennifer Hager, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Hager. Please call me Jenny. Um, I'd like to thank John Solberg for his service in this role for the last two years. I'm looking forward to working with you all uh, for the next two years. A little bit of background on myself. I'm with the city of Minneapolis. I've been there 22 years, and I'm currently the director of transportation planning and programming for the city. Um, the TAC report today, uh, largely just summarizing, we filled out the leadership positions of the TAC and its subcommittees. Um, so Brian Isaacson will continue on as vice chair of TAC, so I'd like to thank him for that. Scott Merrick will continue on as Chair of TAC Planning, and Angie Stenson from Carver County um, as TAC Planning Vice Chair, so a thank you to them. Michael Thompson from the City of Plymouth will continue on as the TAC Funding and Programming Chair, and uh, a thank you to Carl Keel for stepping in and serving as the Vice Chair um, of Funding and Programming. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone? Good luck. Busy season coming up. Um, uh, recall that I did ask you to say your name, so I'm going to ask for somebody to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2022 Move for the Transportation Anderson. Advisory Board. Second, Dugan. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments, any changes, any corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have the consent business is the next. And um, Welcome back, Jenny. Okay, thank you. So today there are four streamlined TIP amendments for you. Um, and for new members, a TIP amendment, we're looking for three things. Uh, fiscal constraint, consistency with the adopted regional transportation plan, and the opportunity for public input. Um, so 2023-03 is a TIP amendment for what's been mentioned already here today, the purchase of electric buses and electric vehicles for Southwest Transit. Um, the, the proposed amendment would add dis new discretionary FTA funding that was awarded directly to Southwest Transit. They're not part of the regional solicitation. Um, the, the TIP amendment does meet the fiscal constraint. The federal and local funds are sufficient to fully fund the project. It is consistent with the regional transportation policy plan, and there is opportunity for public uh, comment through um, the TAB and council meetings. Do you want me to go through all four, Madam Chair, or are we pausing do after each one? Do people need to? Have they read this? Do they feel the need to go through all four? 
No. I know I got a report from my staff. No one's seeing the need to do that. Okay. Are there other questions I, I in general? Just have one quick Please. question on the, um, the three 2022 regional solicitation projects. One of them, when we approved them, had a program year of 2027. And so are we setting a precedence by moving that up five years or? I mean, a lot of them, they'll have like three or four years or they were earlier. Mm -hmm. This particular one said 2027 for the program year. Uh, Madam Chair, board member, I'm gonna call a lifeline here. It might be an advanced construct situation, but I wanna confirm that. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. So uh, the prod, you know, this year was a little bit different than we had earlier year money. You know, we talked about that, particularly the 2023, which we're in was a challenge to find projects. And so um, we asked nearly all of the 91 projects that were ended up being selected, which one of those projects could go early. Um, even if, if they said in their application they wanted a later program year, and then we did find enough projects to take that earlier year, mo year money. So that's, that's what's transpired over the last two months here, a lot of staff coordination uh, to find which projects could take the earlier years. So, Madam Chair, Please. I, so absent that unique situation, this is something we probably would not do in the future. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Thank okay. You. Any other question? Questions? Questions? Questions for Jenny? Seeing none, then I'll ask somebody to um, move this with their name. So moved, Jepson. Second, Geisler. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We go on to the non-consent calendar, the 2023 TAB Executive Committee, and I'm actually gonna hand this over to Elaine for presentation. This one, right there. As part of our TAB bylaws, the um, TAB Executive Committee is selected in January of each year. The TAB exec members serve one year, so we do this every year and the meetings are held in the even months of the year, so six month meetings per year. And in, at the end of the year, uh, Chair Hovland requested all those that were interested in serving on the TAC, TAB Executive Committee to submit their names. And we do have a slate of, of members who volunteered. I'm gonna read their names, and we also had had some members contact me later after the slate was published that they deferred to take their name off the slate. So for the county board members, we had Debbie Gattel, Trista Manas Castillo, John Ulrich, and Mary Liz Holberg. And both Debbie Gattel and John Ulrich have let me know that they would take their names off so we don't have to ballot. And the two members for the county would then be Trista Manas Castillo and Mary Liz Holberg. Can I make a comment? Sure. It's admirable that two are deferring, giving others a chance, and that's a good thing, although I'm really referring to you, not myself. But I, I, I uh, would suggest another possibility that um, we, we could consider, we couldn't act on it today, but that we make the vice chair a, a member automatically. So you, would, you, if we change the bylaws and made the vice chair a member, uh, then you wouldn't be filling a county spot, you'd be filling the vice chair spot. So I'm just suggesting that that may be something we want to consider as a possibility. I, I can respond to that. Oh. The chair would be appointed at the next, at the council meeting coming up, and then at the first TAB executive committee member meeting, they would pick the first vice chair and second vice chair for the year. So the first and second vice chairs come out of the TAC, TAB exec membership. So, so it'd be have to reset quite somebody a Somebody would have to step up to be the first vice chair. Um, currently, the second vice chair is um, Mark, Mark, Mark. Winshuttle. Mark. So whether he would step up or someone else would, and that would be determined at the February meeting. Okay, so it doesn't really mm -hmm. work very seamlessly. Thank, thank you for thinking of that. Okay. You know, I, I just, I wanted to say, I tried to get a hold of Trista this morning. I wasn't able to call and connect with her. I'm sorry. Um, but Mary Jo McGuire was kind enough to let me set, step up. I will let you step up. I, I may want to come back someday, but I appreciate that. So, thank you. Madam Chair, Please. kind of to this point, it seems that maybe we should take a look at our bylaws. I mean, we don't even have appointments for Metro Cities or met council appointments yet for TAB. We don't have a TAB chair. I mean, it's, 
it, it may be time to look Timing at those is, bylaws is an issue and maybe say like no later than March 1st or Updates. following a full appointment of TAB members. I mean, we don't even know who some of the TAB <laughs> members are going to be and we're already presenting the executive board. And then I would like to see something uh, as far as um, some type of division on the county appointments as far as one between Ramsey and Hennepin and maybe they flip every other year and then the five collar counties maybe rotate or something so that that's good I mean bylaws need to be updated ever so often and mm -hmm. um, we can certainly uh, we'll bring that back to Jim when he yeah. gets back so, and I appreciate you guys working it out because I do think it's important that there be a collar county on the executive board Jalali, you have it. Member Jalali. Thank you. Um, I, I'm supportive of what it sounds like our working plan is, and I want to also appreciate just the discussions that seem like they've worked some things out. I wanted to just ask, um, is there a function by which there are like alternate exec committee people, and is that something that Currently. we could create a mechanism for down the road? Because I know that the tab is already quite a commitment for all of us as members, and then adding something on that can become tough sometimes. And it just seems like it would be a nice thing to have and allow additional members to still serve at different points. And so I guess um, maybe that's a note for the future or something to ask about. But well, I would personally really be interested in a function like that, too. I think everybody should try to get into one of those executive committees if you can, because then you'd see what's really going on in some of those executive committees. Some of us around this board are shaking their heads. Yeah, we know. There is no decisions being made in that meeting, just so you know. The only thing that, that the biggest decisions we make is maybe an informational item we'd like to see. Um, but it's a lot of really great discussion about what we want to make sure Pat, um, um, staff brings to us and such like this. So it's not a decision-making body at all. And anybody who wants to come to those meetings is invited. So you can, you just let Elaine know and come on in. And actually, if you want to comment on something, we, you could certainly comment there. It's a very um, laid back meeting and we want to have conversations with everyone. Go ahead, Mr. Hall, um, Member Hollingshead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given that it's not a decision-making body, does it still come under the open meeting law in the, in the sense that it has to be in person or could it be WebEx? That meeting can be WebEx. It, it can be virtual, but right now it's meeting right before TAB because we were meeting in right. person prior to the pandemic. That might be something we could discuss future of I think for and those that of meeting us, could be held at different times. I think for those of us not I'm not continuing on the executive committee, but uh, all of the members here in the public is the public invited to to exec or not? I, uh, it's an open meeting. It's but an open meeting. We yes. post it online. So I think could. if there could be a hybrid, you know, where people who can't be there in person could attend. We haven't explored that with the exec committee yet. I mean, we have hybrid here. But I think oh, it also okay. might be limited by the room we're in. We'll have to see. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I was going to make a comment. With the selecting the membership, the delay in filling the positions on the tab you, usually occurs every four years at when there's the governor's election. Typically, most of the members are seated and selected by December, and they're at, already at the January meeting. So it's whenever we have a governor's election, everything gets delayed of when the appointments are made. So this Even with Metro Cities? Metro Cities does theirs throughout the year. So when people step off and that, and it de depends on elections too, but for the opening that they have right now, it was because it was open because Julie Jepson, it was in the middle of her term, so they weren't recruiting for that position. It was because she became the account, Nuka okay. County Commissioner. So because of that one, it... Sorry, everyone. <laughs> that one opened Jeez. up that position. It just rattled things up. And they, they finished their recruiting, and they meet the day after TAB, so they will be filling that position tomorrow. So it's just the timing of when they have their meeting. Everybody had to be up and reapply for their Met Council positions as well. Yeah, so. because of the four-year term. So it's yes. a, typically a four-year when we get the delay. But mm -hmm. we can put something into the bylaws of how we want to deal with it. Deal with that, yeah. yeah. Other con going through the action transmittal. Um, um, okay. For the board members of cities of first class, Mitra Delali and Emily Koski yeah. did con yeah. talk to each other, and Mitra is putting her name forward to be added to the slate for the city position, a first class position. For board members of the remaining cities, the volunteers are Mark Winshuttle of Chaska and Mark Stephenson of Maple Grove. 
members representing citizen board members with Chris Geisler, Randy Maluchnik, and Peter Dugan. And then after the slate was published, Randy and Peter reached out and said that they would take their names off the slate. And then members representing the mobile and remaining agency board members, we had Brian Martinson, and then I also missed putting Matt Holland's head on the <coughs> slate. He had told me verbally at the November meeting that he would volunteer, and I didn't have an email from him. <laughs> and he has let me know, too, that he would defer to Brian. So that's the slate before you. So again, with your name, can we have a motion on the slate? I'll move approval, Anderson. Second, Second. Martinson. Okay. okay. Second, Holland said, and Dugan. Okay. Um, all in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Welcome to the executive committee. Uh, moving on to other non-consent items. Item two is the uh, Metropolitan Airports Commission 2023-2029 Capital Improvement Plan. Um, Jenny, you're back up here again. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. Um, so this item would have been before you in December had Mother Nature cooperated. Um, the item before you is to approve the staff analysis of the MAX um, 2023 to 2029 CIP. This needs to be reviewed by the council per statute. So things that uh, staff are looking for in that review would be adequacy of the public participation process, um, looking at any CIP projects meeting certain dollar thresholds and commenting on the consistency with the Regional Transportation Policy Plan. Um, your memo kind of defines the process and how it got a little wound up with the cancellation of the TAB December meeting. Um, so this has moved through the Airports Commission and the Council already and is waiting on the action of this board today to be finalized. So if there's any questions, I'll stand for that. Are there questions regarding the Capital Improvement Program? Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. This is actually a question I, I was going to pose to uh, Vice President Reef Mack, uh, but I didn't, I didn't get recognized, so I'll, I'll pose it to you, but either of you are free to answer, I guess. Uh, and within the CIP line items, I noted that there was a small amount allocated for uh, air quality monitoring devices in, in the uh, Terminal 1 area, I believe, in conjunction with the IMAX air handling system. I think that's what that is. I don't know that acronym, but my question is whether there's also uh, improvements in in the uh, air filtration system that's being uh, that's being implemented in the terminal. Since we have COVID as an airborne disease that has been with us now for three years and has clearly had substantial impact on MAC operations, uh, there will be future airborne illnesses as well. Air filtration in settings such as this. Uh, are important. Uh, the WHO and the CDC are now back to recommending masking in indoor settings. And so air filtration is part of that process as well. So I'm curious as to whether the CIP in its substantial amount of money uh, is putting some of that money into improving air quality. Thank you, Madam Chair and member. And I will see if either Bridget or Cole can answer that. <clears throat> Welcome back, Bridget. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. <clears throat> so um, the operational improvements program that I talked about at the front of our house significantly improved airflow in the front of the house where all the check-in is, where most of the waiting is, um, just as part of the overall um, HVAC improvements. So we had new penthouses. We have all new circulation of airflow throughout that part of the building. The arrivals level with all of our new bag carousels are also designed with all new different type of airflow systems to help generate better circulation throughout that level. So in parts and pieces, yes. Overall, when we're talking about the building in its entirety, I can't say yes, we've incorporated all of that yet, but we are making strides. And when we do these major projects, those are things that we're looking into. Member Holmberg, you had your Thank you. Oh, is that, are you? Yep, that's great. Member Holmberg? Uh, yeah, I just want to, confirm on the Air Lake project it will not uh, result in larger aircraft landing in Lakeville. Is that correct? <laughs> um, Madam Chair, For members. The record. So the, <laughs> the proposed project at Air Lake um, does propose to extend the runway length. Right. So longer runway length um, provides a better safety margin for aircraft. The runway there is already nearly 4,000 feet long, so it already accommodates a significant number of business jets. Um, and so 
we're not forecasting um, that we'd have a design aircraft change or anything like that, but you will continue to see operations by jet activity at Air Lake. Okay. We'll put that on the record. Member Geisler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Just uh, one question, just uh, it's kind of re referring back to the improvements. When you did the uh, improvements for the solar panels and all the electricity efficiency and all that, are you seeing the, the returns coming through on that project, uh, especially as you're adding more energy efficiency throughout the terminal? So, Madam Chair, members, so, uh, yeah, specific to the, to the solar panels, so they provide about four and a half megawatts total of our about 15 megawatts that we use um, a day at, at our airfield. We coordinate very closely with Excel Energy because um, we do have a forecast for a significant increase in energy usage as we go forward. Um, and work very closely with them on all of our uh, efficiencies um, available, um, um, coordination processes, grant processes with, um, with Excel. And so, yes, we're seeing those benefits. And when we do, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we report out um, every six months or so on our sustainability efforts. And a lot of times those reports will include some specifics about specific projects and what the return on our investment is as it relates to those kind of things. So we kind of look at it more um, parcel, but overall our sustainability efforts are looking at those, um, those savings. Thank you. Thank you, other questions? And then I wanna call up Cole. Did you have a presentation on this piece too that you wanted to depart some great information on us? I certainly can. Please do. Greg can bring it up. Thank you. Um, so afternoon members, uh, I'm Cole Heineker, Multimodal Planning Manager at the Met Council, and I'm filling in. We don't currently have an aviation system planner. He left <laughs> in the summer. We're, we're, we're looking to fill that position, so <laughs> I'm filling in, but Bridget did a great job giving you guys some background. I just wanted to let you know, remind you again what your role is in all of this, um, and remind you what Mac's role is, and of course Bridget really covered that, so I'm not going to duplicate what she already covered, but in terms of the Met Council role, and, and TAB is referenced in the Met Council statutes, um, we do have a role in pre preparing an aviation system plan, and we do review all of the long-term comprehensive plans that a airports produce. So it, I thought this important update that Bridget gave at the beginning of this year to let you all know that this is going to be a big year for aviation. This item today is a very standard annual item where we review the CIP. We are going to have comprehensive plans for MSP coming forward this year in addition to potentially flying cloud, you know, depending on the timing. So those will come in front of this body for approval at some point. Um, but, the, but today we're just talking about the CIP. Um, a reminder on, on the things that we look for at staff, this is all discussed in the staff analysis, your business item. We look for big projects. Uh, the state statute actually lays out, we have to look at projects that are over 5 million at MSP, over 2 million at the reliever airports. Uh, and if, if they meet those dollar thresholds, we then look to see if they have something called a significant effect. And so we list the, the various types of significant effects that could occur. And this year, 2023, there are no projects that meet those criteria. So all you're doing is approving the staff review of the CIP to make sure it was adequate and met all of those pieces that uh, Tech Chair Hager laid out. Uh, next year, as Commissioner Holberg referenced, we do have a project that will likely require approval at Lakeville. So just wanna make sure that you all know that. Well, that's a pretty standard action this year. You can expect something slightly different next year. Um, and uh, we did look for all of these elements this year. You know, we, we, we do get a copy of Mac's uh, public engagement process. Uh, we get copied on all their communications with local governments that are affected by the CIP. And so we ensure that all that was in place. And we ensure that this, that this CIP is consistent with the regional aviation system plan. So uh, with that, and again, this was covered by Bridget, so I'm not gonna duplicate this. Um, just stand for any questions you might have about that process. Otherwise, uh, the action in front of you is to just recommend the review. They want to provide one clarification. The Transportation Committee of the Met Council acted on this last week. It's going to the full Met Council next week, pending your approval. So it's on the, the agenda for next week's council meeting. And uh, President, CEO, I can't remember his title, Brian Ricks is, is going to be giving the same presentation Bridget gave to the full council to bring them up to speed as well. Okay. Questions? around this presentation. We wish you luck in the next year then, as you look for your other CIPs. 
Um, at this time, again, stating your name, I'd entertain a motion for approval. We do have to approve this. This is Kermans. I would approve. Over second. It's been moved and seconded. <laughs> um, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries, and we move on to the next item, which is um, the 23, 2023 adoption of the safety performance targets. Jenny, you're back up here again, and it looks like we have a presentation also by Heidi Shelberg. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Board Members. I'll do a brief introduction and then turn it over to Heidi Shelberg for more detailed uh, information. So setting of the 2023 safety performance targets, this is something that all state DOTs and MPOs uh, need to do. Um, it's a federal requirement. Uh, this is one of five performance targets that need to be, or there's, there's five safety performance measures that need to be set. Um, the TAC did recommend adoption of the recommended safety performance targets. There was some discussion by the TAC around the current trends. Um, the data that you're going to see in Heidi's presentation represents all crashes on all roads. Um, in the MPO planning area, meaning there's really multiple agencies that are responsible for helping to meet these established safety performance targets. Um, we're not meeting them as a region, um, and those trend lines are not tracking to meet those targets. Um, so there's really, there's a lot more work that needs to be done and, and things that we need to consider and how we can disrupt those trend lines. So with that, I will turn it over to Heidi for her presentation. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you, Chair Hager, um, Madam Chair and members. So I am here in place of Jed Hansen today, who has um, been taking this through our technical committees as well. And so as Chair Hager mentioned, this is an annual business item that we bring before TAB, asking for your recommendation to the council to set annual targets um, for our federally required safety performance measures. I'll just briefly touch on the requirements, the methodology that we've been using, the proposed targets, and then where we're at today. Um, so I think Chair Hager covered this. Um, generally, the overall point of this is to use this information to help inform our planning and programming discussions and decisions overall. Um, and I'll touch on what the measures are as we go through those. So as an MPO, we do have two options. We can set our own target, or we can just simply say that we support the state DOT's target. Since this rule has started, we have set our own target for the region. Um, one important thing is that state DOTs are reviewed by US DOT to determine you know, if they are meeting their targets. And if they are not, they have some financial implications if they aren't doing that. That would affect their highway safety improvement program funding allocation. So that does not apply to MPOs. So we have the very real effects of the number of people who are dying or being seriously injured on our roads. But beyond that, there's not additional oversight or review, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. And when, this is something that we have to have set by the end of February every year. So the methodology we've been using um, in consult, consulting with a small work group of some of our local partners, we use the statewide strategic highway safety plan as our starting point for this methodology. So that plan sets a sh kind of more shorter term goal of by 2025, in the whole state having no more than 20, 225 traffic deaths and no more than 980 serious injuries. And that was an aggressive goal and it was set at the time. Um, and to determine our methodology, we basically took kind of the historic average of the region's share of those crashes to set the regional share of those goals. Um, so what our goals would be, and this is again, kind of on the way to zero, right? It's not acceptable to get to these levels. This is still just kind of a shorter intermediate term goal of working toward eventually having no one die or be seriously injured on our transportation <clears throat> network. But so that intermediate term goal for the region is no more than 74 people dying, no more than 464 serious injuries. There is a separate measure that um, combines the bicyclist and pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries. Um, those are also included in the overall numbers that we'll talk about. Um, and so that goal is for no more than 115. So we're basically, when we worked with the work group, determined that we would basically be using kind of a straight line decline to that 2025 timeline. Um, and again, this is just kind of used as a tool to say if we want to reach this shorter term goal on our way to zero, where would we need to be at? 
So it's a tool that we can use to assess how we're actually doing. So we're just kind of including the other years here for context so you can see where that is. The gray line is the proposal for this year for 2023. So we have, we track all fatalities and traffic crashes, all serious injuries. And then again, the bicyclists and pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries are kind of a little bit of a disaggregation. Um, even though they're included in the overall numbers, they are combined in a separate measure because they're mo the most vulnerable travelers on our networks. And then we do also track the rates um, for both fatalities and serious injuries per 100,000 million um, vehicle miles traveled. So I do want to make a note about the VMT that we used in this. Um, so when we set the targets for 2022, um, because of the start of the pandemic, the most recently observed VMT we had was 2020, which we know is a little bit of an anomaly with some sharp declines. So we did use 2019 as that base year when we set the, the rates um, for estimating future vehicle miles traveled. Um, so that target is based on an estimate that's a little bit higher than what was observed in those years. So I do just want to note that. So again, as I mentioned, this is an opportunity for us to take a look at how we're actually doing. You know, we have these data goals. Um, what does it look like and how can this inform our policy and programming discussions? So um, thanks to our partners at MnDOT who were able to give us some preliminary numbers for 2022. So it does take some time to finalize crash data. This is still pretty early. These numbers are definitely subject to change as that data are finalized throughout the year. Um, and I will also note this also only just covers for 2022, the seven county metro. So it's not including the urbanized portions of Wright and Sherburn counties. So this tracks our five measures. Um, the gray is signifying where we did not meet our targets. So this is showing from last year and then the previous three years as comparisons. So for last year, we're missing all of our targets. We're not on track for where we need to be, as Chair Hager referred to. So the target, if we were kind of making progress on our way to zero to reach that shorter term goal, um, would have been 98. And instead, we had 180 people die last year and not make it home because of a traffic crash. Um, we had 971 serious injuries versus the target of 669. Um, so in general, Overall, we're, we're not on a good trend with, with that. This next few slides are just basically kind of showing some of these a little bit more graphically. The fatalities are the red line, um, the targets are the blue line, so you can see we were getting a little bit closer to the target in previous years, um, and then the last couple of years, the trend has been a sharp increase. For serious injuries, um, this is the one where for two years, we were actually below our targets for serious injuries, um, and then again, the trend um, is going in the opposite direction of where we need it to be. Um, and this is similar with the, the combined bike ped fatalities and serious injuries. Target information, again, the actual numbers are the red line and the targets are the blue, um, where these are a sharper increase overall. So this is the last kind of performance slide. This slide does, um, we do get information from MnDOT, thankfully. So even though the required measure combines bicyclists and pedestrians, fatalities and serious injuries, MnDOT does disaggregate that for us um, just to make those modes clear. And we do have the total numbers on this one as well. Um, so this gives you some context. With crash data, it can be helpful to look at it over a broader length of time, not just changes from the previous year. So when we're looking at our preliminary numbers from last year, we can compare it to what how did this look compared to the previous year, but also um, the first year of the COVID pandemic, as well as that three-year average. Three-year averages or longer averages can be really helpful with crash data just to kind of help smooth out some of the general variation that you tend to see year to year. Um, and so overall, you can still see that even looking at that three-year average from before the COVID pandemic, our total fatality numbers are up. Um, I will note with the bicyclist fatalities, those numbers are so small um, in general that any fluctuation with that really changes the percentages. Um, but with both bicyclists and pedestrians, when we look at the serious injuries, um, that continues to be an area of concern, not just with increases in the last couple of years, 
but in relation to the three-year average as well. Um, one other thing I'll note about this, when we do look at bicyclist and pedestrian numbers as a percent of our total, um, the fatalities are about 17% of our total fatalities are people biking or walking. And when we look at serious injuries, it's about 23%. So they're kind of overrepresented in these numbers. And again, as the most vulnerable travelers. So the good news in a kind of otherwise grim topic um, is that we do, have, and again, the purpose of these is to provide tools for you to, to use to assess. We have these stated goals. How are we doing? Um, where do we need to be and where are we right now? So that that can inform policy and programming discussions. And so we do have work coming up in the next couple of years that will set up for to have to be having some of those discussions. Um, both of the regional development guide that you'll hear about as an informational item on your agenda today. You'll hear about that as far as safety is being discussed in terms of the values, visions, and goals for that plan. Um, and then as well with the update for the transportation policy plan for 2050. We are currently doing a goals review, engagement, and update study of the, of the goals for the transportation policy plan. And so that will be one venue to have that discussion about where does the safety kind of rank in this? Where should it be prioritized? And what, what might need to stay the same? What might need to change? How can this influence the plan direction? Um, also in later phases of policy engagement with the plan, um, there will be opportunities. So I had mentioned that we had discussion with the work group where MPOs are not evaluated by USDOT in this. But the work group did have a suggestion saying there's nothing stopping the region from holding itself accountable. So should the region have a policy of if we're not meeting our targets, we do X, Y, or Z. Um, so that, that may be part of a discussion later in the transportation policy plan as well. Um, and then we are doing a regional safety action plan as a follow-up to the one that focused on pedestrians. So this one will focus on vehicle crashes and then vehicle bicycle crashes. It is broader than just the solicitation, so I know the, the only bullet point on the slide is the solicitation, um, but that is one of the big tasks in that, both to make recommendations for the TPP update, but also to take a look at our programming as well and what might need to change um, after doing some additional data analysis to help us better understand trends in the region. So with that, I would be happy to try to answer any questions. Um, Otherwise, it is an action before you today to make the recommendation to the council for the current year target. Thank you, Commissioner. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm just wondering if um, there's a place that we can find additional information, like cause of the crash, was it engineering, was it speed, was it operator error, you know, because the numbers are numbers, but they don't tell us what policies need to change. If it's a matter of speed limits, is it the road design, is it engineering, are there things that can be mitigated to help, or is it operator error, operator usage, uh, or abuse of a vehicle, whatever that might be. Great question, um, Madam Chair and member. Um, so as I mentioned, this analysis doesn't get to that level. Um, part We will be looking at just kind of higher level trends, um, so it won't be going into individual crash data reports in the Regional Safety Action Plan, but we'll be looking at some of the systemic factors involved in those crashes. Um, you know, I'll say that's just also one plan that's being done in the region as well. Um, you know, a lot of our partners are involved in different safety planning. MnDOT has been a fantastic partner and leader in this area, um, you know, as I'm sure all the counties know with funding county safety plans as well. Um, I know that some of our partners have applied for some of the Safe Streets and Roads for All funding, and of course we're hopeful that everybody in the region that applied gets that. So there's a lot of work being done on a lot of different levels to try to get to more of that level of detail to help us address the root causes so that we're not just chasing individual situations, but trying to address the systemic issues. I just want to just add Please. follow up. I just think it'd be really helpful if we saw what those trends are and then if there are recommendations, whether coming from the TAC or other committees, to say, here are the things that we can do to mitigate to get to these numbers, because just numbers don't right. really tell us anything, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Member Koski and then Member Geisler. Thank you, Chair Gattel. Uh, I just Sorry. wanted to kind of reinforce some of the things that. Ms. Schalberg had said um, in that I, you had kind of said it quickly, but you know, any serious or fatal injury 
is unacceptable and we need to make sure that our goal really is zero. And I can see from these trend lines, we are definitely falling away from that. Uh, it's a little personal to me at the moment because I am the council member in South Minneapolis and just last week had a fatal uh, pedestrian uh, injury. And so this is this area has always been something I've been working towards and it's a, a multi-jurisdictional area. It's an area where over two million people come to be enjoy our park system, um, but it is definitely an area that of high concern for many residents. And so, um, you know, seeing these trends lines are are concerning to me, and I know that we we all need to do our part. You know, at the city of Minneapolis, we have our Vision Zero, which is equivalent to the you know toward zero uh, deaths. But you know, I just I like your last page. You know, here on the presentation, stating that you know in our next regional solicitation that we work towards really changing these trend lines and <clears throat> thinking about what we can be doing um, in our work here to do that. So, thank you, Member Geisler. Thank you. You're going to turn. Uh, I would actually, great follow-up behind that. Uh, the regional solicitation criteria and weightings, we have a safety category in almost every single area. We've, over the multiple solicitations I've been here, we've, we've maybe a slightly tweaked or maybe added or something. If, if this is truly a space where if we want to make a change and prioritize safety, we can shift points into that away from other areas in all the modes, not just roads, not just bike pad, um, but especially given our desire to put uh, more non-motorized individuals into our transportation system via all the other methods, it, we're increasing our vulnerable populations, which should mean we should be increasing our focus on safety, especially in the transportation system. So I, I do think that that is a very purposeful space that TAB can weigh in on to decide safety is a priority and we want to prioritize projects that have good safety outcomes built into them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kowalski. I wanted, uh, uh, I wanted to follow up on uh, Commissioner Mata Castillo. Um, the information, it would be nice to get a follow-up data. Um, one, I'd like to know where there, if there were repetitive locations. Um, and also, uh, or maybe repetitive in the general area, maybe not at the specific, I, maybe, maybe there isn't, but it'd be interesting to know that. Um, the other thing is, and I asked this, remember asking this a few years ago on a similar presentation about, do you track our people on a phone or distraction part of the cause. I would think that's trended down some, but we, <coughs> those must be in police reports, so I'd like to have that data. And then um, I hear more and more about, uh, I'll call it a driverless <coughs> car, really to the point of driverless, um, where the, right now, even without the proper striping, uh, you know, they really don't have to have hands on, hands on the foot on the brake or anything. It'd be nice to be able to uh, look into that and project what the trend would be on this uh, in the future. So those are just some things. Mm -hmm. Okay. My comments are very similar. I, this is actually the what. You know, this describes what. The why, I mean, if I reinterpret what I've heard is somebody else does that. I, you know, well, let's hear from that somebody else. Let's have a presentation here on the why. Um, I got to tell you, just on a personal, on safety, and I like the putting more points in for safety, but I, I, every, I drive up north on 169, you know, almost weekly. Yeah, weekly. And when I hit Aiken, the road maintenance in terms of snow and ice is, it's like, who flipped the switch? It's horrible here, and they don't have any different snow conditions or rain or ice conditions there then and it's like I, I just think of this report every time I get that stretch I go well, they must have more deaths here you know and I remember years ago MnDOT said uh, they wanted some extra money for those wire fences that they put between um, roads and they said well if we put these that'll reduce deaths you know and, and they had they had the why answer there and I, so I, I guess I'm looking for a why presentation to us at some point 
Okay. Why, why and how? Well, you know, here's why the accents, okay. here's how we're responding, here's how we're, you know. Ms. Michelle Moore. Um, thank you all for your comments so far. This is very helpful to hear. Um, if I can just respond kind of to the last two, too. So one of the things that we will be doing in the Regional Safety Action Plan, um, and you talked about um, kind of if there are repetitive locations, one of the tasks we will be doing is looking at what's often referred to as like high injury streets. Minneapolis has used this in its Vision Zero program where you're looking at kind of a density of the fatal and serious injury crashes if there is a streets where quarters where those are happening more. So that is part of the work that we will be doing as part of that project. And you know, of course, we'd be happy to bring that back as, as that work is done as we have that developed. Um, I'll also just say I think there are a lot of great questions about the, the why. And I'll say one of the things that I think safety in general is moving towards that we're seeing this um, at the federal level interest is kind of what they refer to as a safe system approach. Um, sorry, with pandemic time, I can't remember which year. Those of you that have been on tab for a little bit, we had Mark Doctor from Federal Highway mm -hmm. present on safe system approach in the last couple of years, whichever year it was. Um, and really part of the thinking of that too is that we also need to build redundant systems because we're human. We're gonna make mistakes. You know, distraction may be one thing, but how do we build redundancy into our systems that somebody doesn't die or be seriously injured because of that. Um, so that's kind of part of the, the challenge before us in this too. It's a multi-layered process um, with all of us in it as stakeholders, so. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. And it's, it's clear that these numbers are, to all of us, these numbers are not getting better. Um, but one of the things, one of the first meetings that I was attended on TAB was a presentation of the 2017 um, Regional Intersection Safety. Um, that was done again in 2017. Is that done on a cycle, like every five years, every 10 years? I'm going to defer to <laughs> Steve Thanks. on this Thank one. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, yeah, so the, the new version is called the Intersection Mobility and Safety Study. And it is ongoing right now, and we will bring a presentation on that uh, in 2023. Great, thank you. Um, so, so to that point, <clears throat> I think that will shed a lot. Of, that sheds a lot of information to me on that, which then I can go to my uh, police department and get the stats on what caused those accidents. Was a driver impairment? Was it intox? Uh, just not paying attention, too much in a hurry. Um, but I think the, those studies, because based on that study, a lot of work has been done in Blaine because that study showed that Blaine, in a three-mile stretch of road, had five of the six most dangerous and deadly intersections in the seven-county metro. Um, and so what I would like to challenge this group specifically in doing is the people who live in that community know why. We know why that road is so dangerous. And so when we are sitting in this space, I would love for you, I would love to hear your why and why your road needs to be improved and trust you in knowing that I know what I'm talking about. I know my road is incredibly dangerous and deadly. It has eight times more 911 calls on it than the state average. It's ridiculous and it needs funding. And so I just implore this body to listen to those of us who need help in our area to get the money funded for these very life-saving projects. I think we're all hoping for some more of that through the infrastructure dollars, let's hope. Yep. And I think putting in safety is a really good place to put some of it. But I, I'm hearing a lot from my colleagues here that we want, certainly want more. We don't want just the numbers, but we want to we want to be part of the pr uh, problem solving of this. So um, we'll be looking forward to when somebody comes back and gives us the presentation then on the on the, the further data, and then on the rest of what's going on. Um, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, go ahead, member. Madam okay. Chair, members, uh, the information that I provide to Elaine or Mike Barnes does each month does include kind of a breakdown of where those crashes and what some of the causal factors are, and that's information that we have, you know, we have monthly reported to us. You know, distracted driving is definitely on the rise, but so is speed-related crashes. So, you know, improvements to the system as a whole. 
Um, I drive Highway 65, um, so very familiar with that. And you know, speed is is high, and people are impatient. And I think there have been lots of things that sort of impacted the overall. Um, and the number of fatalities and number of overall crashes that we're experiencing on the roadway. So maybe congestion was a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> but it did slow people down a bit. So anyway, thank you. That's all. Okay. All right. Any other final comments here? We do have to approve this today. So again, please signify with your name if you'll make a motion. I'm looking for a motion. So moved, Anderson. Thank you. Commissioner. Second, Dugan. Thank you. Dugan. Um, all those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And that concludes our non-consent business. Um, we move on to information items. Um, the first information item I have is congestion management process, Twin Cities Congestion Analysis Handbook. Um, David Burns and Tim Burkhart from Alliant Engineering, welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, David Burns uh, with the with the council, I'm the project manager for this project for the council. Uh, just uh, I'm going to say a few words about this and then kick it over to Tim from Alliant Engineering, who was the consultant project manager. Um, and so basically, this is uh, a tool that feeds off our CMP policies and procedures document, which was um, completed in 2020, but we worked on between 2017 and 2018. And um, it really serves as kind of a how-to guide to implement uh, implementing those strategies identified within that policies and procedures uh, handbook and, and um, provides users the ability to sort of uh, analyze a corridor in a consistent manner throughout the region. Um, so this work began in very late 2020, uh, early 2021. Um, the work was completed this fall. It's, it's been through TAC and actually Transportation Committee. Um, I think we might have ran out of time uh, two months ago or last month at TAB. So here we are to present upon it. And with that, I will turn it over to Tim to run through the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and board members. I will do this uh, quickly, and you can ask more questions as you like. Um, and I think you can focus both on what the purpose, kind of what this tool does, and then also how we did it, because I think both are a little bit new and different. So I'll uh, go through a little more details, the goals of the handbook and highlights of what's inside it and then where we're headed next. Um, so things that Dave already hit on in terms of uh, the desire to take that congestion management process, which you I'll know to some extent and provide guidance for really how to implement it on a project or corridor basis. Um, trying to provide a regional consistency in a corridor study or a congestion analysis study so that when products come to the council, there's a sense that they've been sort of all done in a similar fashion. Um, and then building in things that we're all familiar with in a lot of the planning and projects today, building in multimodal strategies, emphasizing people, not just the infrastructure, and then in this case, uh, trying to build in more direct linkage with the analysis to what might be required or desired in the regional solicitation process. Um, keeping it simple, not trying, we tried hard not to produce just another large tome and report, and I'll show you how that works. It's very map-based and focusing on just a handful of uh, data, not everything under the sun. Um, again, really trying to integrate the people side, the lived experience as, as part of the data collection and analysis. And then while the handbook doesn't tell you what to do, you know, what to build or not build on a corridor, we do try to link that analysis to potential congestion management strategies with the tool that I will also go through. We applied the handbook to several um, corridors to test it out and refine it. And then we assume it is a living document as most of these are as are as we uh, learn more. So um, the handbook has four main steps. The first one is, is the corridor, is the location congested? Lots of ways to ans answer that, but we chose to focus on the congestion dashboard that the council has developed, which is an easy lookup tool. You plug in the corridor and you can get a number out. The thresholds there on the screen are ones that we set initially for is the corridor congested, possibly congested or not congested. You can follow the handbook process regardless of that answer, but a not congested corridor is probably gonna be less likely to 
bear fruit in terms of interest in uh, funding a project at the end. So after that screening, um, this is kind of the guts of it in terms of collecting information. We've got these three buckets of people and equity, land use, and transportation. And really what's important here is you know, that transportation is the infrastructure and typical transportation performance. Um, but we ask people to start with understanding who it is that is in the corridor or using the corridor, both generally and then specifically from an equity perspective. So you can see all those bullet points there are, uh, is information we ask the handbook user to collect. Similar with land use, before we go and sort of race to the transportation uh, problem or solution, understand where we are in the metro, what type of community, what type of uh, multimodal uh, service exists or would make sense. Um, each of the bullets you see here, I think there are about uh, 17 or 19. Each one of those is a data point, essentially, that we ask people to report on in the handbook. Um, a lot of them are very easy to look up, so. So after that step two, um, write it all down. But again, this is a little bit different. It's meant to be um, a summary and map-based. So we ask the user to prepare a short narrative. What did you find? What's happening in the corridor? and then a whole bunch of maps to back that up. Um, with each data point, we do ask the user to say not just what did you find, but what's, what are the implications, what's important. Often we don't quite do that. Um, and then at the end, just write up a problem statement. And those of you familiar with uh, things like the purpose need we get into the, in the environmental process, it's don't tell us what the answer is, but tell us what the problem is. And then let's move on to step two. Last step is that strategy consideration that I mentioned, and I'll go through some quick examples of this. Um, the CMP, thick document, has an appendix in it that lists, I think, 77 strategies for uh, addressing congestion. We didn't reinvent the wheel, we took those, but we did reorganize them a little bit into those five categories you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and going sort of in a hierarchical approach from travel demand management through traffic management technology, spot movement, mobility, easy pass, and then um, ultimately to strategic capacity enhancement. So again, uh, you, can, you can get there, but we ask the handbook user to specifically see what you can do before you go to the capacity solutions. Um, and the uh, right side of the screen there, we just ask, based on the information you have at this point, rate those strategies. How, how well will it address the need or problem that you identified? Low, medium, high, not applicable. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so inside the handbook, each of those data points has a, about a one page, what I call the instruction sheet. It says why this is important, where you get the information, and what to do with it when you get it. Um, most of these data points are an easy lookup. This is not quite a fully online product, but it's headed, headed in that direction in that more and more of this data is available um, online in a way that's easy to get to and easily updated. So the instruction sheets, then we provide some narratives, again, to kind of get at what we're uh, asking people to do to try to focus down a write-up, get to the heart of it, and again, interpret and provide implications for um, each item that you've collected. Lots of maps and graphics. We uh, did examples for each quarter, for each data point, and we tried to produce a high quality graphic, but a handbook user doesn't have to do that. They could print out a Google map and write on it with a marker. Um, the handbook really is intended to be flexible and not too burdensome, so city or county with a whole bunch of staff and consultant money or handful of staff can, can use it equally. Um, you can't see all the details here, but this is what that strategy screening tool looks like. It's a, it's, it's a sheet with a drop down where you can kind of click low, medium, high, and the colors light up as you go through each of those strategies. It looks like a lot of information, but once you've gone through the data, it doesn't take that much to give your initial thought. So those strategies don't necessarily stick. You do this handbook, and then there's a, another process for, say, getting funding or designing or otherwise implementing a solution. But the point is we've done all this good work in the CMP, and all those 77 things 
you know, pretty much encapsulates the ways we can address congestion in those categories. So let's use those and start to focus in on, on what, what might work and what is just uh, not applicable. So that's what's in the handbook. Um, it is essentially finalized. The thing to come this year is the council intends to do additional piloting through a new uh, consultant contract and offer, um, as I understand it, this as a, as a resource that cities and counties could apply to um, have a corridor analyzed using the handbook, which both will inform the handbook, make sure, see if it needs any tweaks, and also provide some, some real world uh, results from it. I believe that's all I have. Um, happy to take questions or questions. Uh, Member Geisler today. and then Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I just had a little question on your step two of understanding context and clause, causes there. Um, I'm, I was glad to see that you're calling out transit dependence in there because, you know, that's two sets of tires with a whole lot of bodies on it. Um, but the question I did have is <coughs> where is freight considered in this? Um, being that that's kind of the other side. I know you get the bullet for workers and economy, but is freight part of one of the measures that's in this as well? That's a good question. I know we discussed that, and it doesn't appear in the, in the list here. It is sort of built in, I guess, indirectly into that workers and economy, though that's really more about sort of job, job centers um, from that perspective. So um, we do have on the transportation side, there's a, the last bullet there is optional data, and freight certainly falls under there. We didn't call it out or make it mandatory. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, another piece I didn't see included, and maybe I just missed it, but how is transit-oriented uh, development included as a congestion tool on major transit ways and land use, and how does that play into this uh, handbook? Um, I guess two answers. The TOD as a tool would certainly be in that list of 77 strategies or other land use um, you know, planning tools is, is in there. If we pulled that up, I don't have the whole list. And then on the front end, if you look at what's on this slide, um, understanding to the extent those would be relevant, I think the, that sort of middle column of land use, both just what the land use is, but then specifically what types of um, walk, bike environment do you have or what sort of transit environment do you have? Is that... Part of it. it feels like it could be emphasized as part of the tool and not what the land use is now, but what the land use could be in order to help with congestion control. So if we encourage development on major transit ways, right, less people driving too far because they can live work where they're at, right, and get access. So that's what I was, it seems like there could be a, a more robust place for that. And maybe there is. But. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's great feedback. Mm -hmm. Back. Thank you very much. Problem. Member Martinson. Um, thank you, Chair. So I, following on that point, I think, um, so I, I'm going to take a little bit of an iconoclastic perspective on congestion. I'm not a big fan of the travel time index. And, and one of the things that I see is lacking here that I think would be beneficial is um, some discussion of some of these, some of these strategies in, that are designed to respond to congestion will actually make it worse in the long run. Some will make it better. So start with, I would like to see the guidebook start with a recognition that um, public roadways are generally an underpriced public good. And therefore they suffer from the fact that like many underpriced public goods, they're overconsumed. And so if you, if, if you add more capacity through strategic capacity enhancements or spot mobility, you're basically exacerbating that problem by further underpricing a public good and making more of it available to which it will be overconsumed further. Therefore, in the long run, you don't reduce congestion, you make it worse. Some of these strategies like the easy pass are a weak form of congestion pricing. Stronger forms of congestion pricing have been used elsewhere in the world, like in London, England, right? Where you basically do everything you can to try to keep cars out of the core areas of a city. And so I think, so that logic though, doesn't show up anywhere in the discussion. That, that idea that pricing of this good is a function that we need to build into this process doesn't show up here. 
And I would like to see that if this is a final version of the guidebook, I guess I'm, my input is too late. But I think if one thinks about it that way, one is going to prioritize certain of these strategies, travel demand management, greater investment in transit, better use of land that requires people to drive less to get where they need to be. This reduces vehicle miles traveled, and I think vehicle miles traveled doesn't show up anywhere in here either, right? Which is part of this whole question as well. So um, critical feedback from me, the, the non-motorized representative. <laughs> Any response to that? Yeah, the, um, um, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Martinson. Um, I, I would just say that uh, based on this hierarchy, we, we do, um, I mean, expansion and strategic capacity enhancements, enhan enhancements are absolutely the um, lowest priority. We're, we're trying to really emphasize travel demand management, which in and of itself is, you know, reducing VMT, increasing high occupancy vehicles, et cetera, and going on from there. And if you were to look at the actual list of 77, I think somewhere around a third to a half are probably travel demand management strategy. So um, appreciate the input, excellent input. Um, I think we do um, some justice in, in kind of um, acknowledging and taking your feedback. So to the extent the guidebook is an educational and an informational tool for policymakers, I think making some of the, that logic more explicit and upfront hmm. would be pedagogically useful, right? So thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Member Cullen. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at... Um, this looks like a good tool, uh, could be very effective if it's used. So how is this being distributed? How are we actually getting organizations to use this? I mean, you can throw this on MnDOT's desk, but is MnDOT going to open it? Is my city engineer going to get a copy of this and even know it exists? Uh, what about my county level transportation on my county state aid highways? Um, so it's not a mandated thing that everybody has to use this. How are we going to make this effective? Great. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would say that we do have a CMP advisory committee, which is a longstanding committee now that's been um, working together on, on this and developing the CMP process as a whole for the last four years. So um, many of our counties and cities are on board. Um, MnDOT is uh, part of this, FHWA is part of this. And we do have an obligation as an MPO to implement this. Um, so I think this is actually, we're at the very beginning stages of kind of implementing this throughout the region. And I think you'll see as time goes on, um, A, one thing we're doing is actually trying to make an online tool to make this easier so that you know, practitioners don't have to go in and download the data themselves and you know, have, you know, have to reinvent the wheel every time they do a corridor study. It's gonna be an online tool. Um, and B, um, yeah, so I think in the upcoming regional solicitation, that might be um, an area where this could be more thoroughly connected with our programming of projects, if that answers your question. Totally. It sounds like a path. I'm just, I, I want to make sure there's a method to make it happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other, other questions? What? Go ahead, please. So will this, um, if you uh, were somebody doing planning in a sub-region of the metro that didn't necessarily buy into the vision, goals, plan of the Met Council, would you be able to use this tool and reorder or prioritize values to different items? Yeah, thank you for that. Question, good question. I mean, if your number one thing was safety yeah, right. and congestion mitigation, and you didn't care about environment, you didn't care about equity, you didn't care about, you know, you just wanted it, you know, yep. safety and congestion, that's what transportation's all about, all the rest of this is hoo-ha, you know, can I take this tool, 
supercharge those criteria and come out with different colors in your little low, medium, high sure. printout. Uh, I think I'll let Tim cover this one and thank you. He loves you. my questions. But I, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say we, we try very hard to guide them through a specific <laughs> process in which we're to kind of prevent. I mean, that from this happening. low, medium, high reflects a certain value system that Met yep. Council fed into it sure. on the onset. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, to what degree is this variable by other priorities? Um, yeah, I'd be glad to answer that. I, I think there's two part answer. The slide that I put up is what we ask everyone to collect. So we ask everyone to collect the same data to the extent it's relevant to that location. All of it isn't gonna be always relevant. Um, so we're gonna ask you to report on all of these things, regardless of maybe what your interest is, as you indicated. When we get to that strategy rating tool, that really is a self-completed tool. And if you rate something high and I think you're wrong and I'm whoever, that's a discussion. So it's, it's, it's intended, that tool is intended to be helpful. It's intended to say, here are the strategies you know, that come down from the CMP and don't just ignore them, but actively think about them and decide if they're gonna be helpful. So that's how we've set it up. Once you've done that, you haven't built a project, you haven't gotten it funded. That's sort of your case that would continue on in whatever way. So I guess if those if your ratings hold up, then maybe you've got the right answer. Does that help? It might. <laughs> Still got to pass through solicitation and all those criteria. So if it's a project, so some well, I mean, I, I view that my council wants to use this as a planning and evaluation tool eventually after the kinks are worked out. Mm -hmm. And different funding entities have yes. different value systems Correct. that drive their funding. So MIDA right may point. want mm -hmm. a different, you, have, you know, where quarters of commerce maybe yep. could mm -hmm. take Criteria. this mm -hmm. evaluation tool mm -hmm. and supercharge the freight issue and the mobility and the... Mm -hmm some of the others where our friends at the PCA might use this tool for another pot of money with another set of items within Correct. it that are I see where weighted going. more heavily for that funding source. So that's mm -hmm. just where I was trying to go with it. That's interesting, interesting thought. Other comments or questions? Well, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We really appreciate you coming in and, and uh, enlightening us. All right. Thank you very um, thank much. You. Our last informational item for today is the Regional Development Guide. Charles, you're coming up here. And is Lisa Burgess also Community Development? Lisa, welcome. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair members. Uh, for the record, I'm Lisa Barajas, the Executive Director of the Community Development Division at the Council. And Charles Carlson, Executive Director, MTS Council. Um, I know we have a short time with us today, so we want to give a brief maybe whirlwind overview and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to speak with you more uh, in the future as well. Um, but as you know, state statute directs the council to uh, develop a comprehensive development guide prescribing the orderly and economical development of the metropolitan area. The transportation policy plan is one of those three regional system plans that help implement and are required components of our comprehensive development guide. The values, vision, and goals for the region will help guide the development of the TPP and the other policy work that the council is charged with doing, including our regional parks policy plan, our water resources policy plan, and our housing policy plan. Uh, just some context, our staff I know from community development uh, met with you last in May, and you may remember a slide similar to this one. Our intention is to create a similar language structure across all of our policy work to ensure uh, <clears throat> that we are working toward shared outcomes. For example, if we are discussing safety or equitable access across the region, that might mean uh, developing related policies across our transportation, as you've been discussing significantly today, but as well as our parks and our housing work. As we move through uh, forward through policy development and into implementation, we want to make sure that we are learning from our experience and understand if we are having meaningful impact. If not, we may refine our policies and undertake different strategies and actions. 
members, ultimately the development guide uh, relates to the transportation policy plan uh, that comes uh, through this body. Um, effectively, the, the, the TPP becomes part of the uh, regional development guide. It's really a subset of the, of the guide that relates to transportation. So uh, the two efforts are very much connected. Um, they really have that relationship through that vision for the region and then are further developed uh, within the TPP uh, as it relates to uh, goals and objectives. So there are regional vision uh, related items and then those are played out more specifically through the TPP. Ultimately, uh, you know, developed through that progression of, of more and more specific uh, elements, ultimately uh, resulting in regional investment decisions such as uh, the regional solicitation. And so, you know, with, with these elements very much connected, uh, it, it, we advance them together as well. And we'll get into the committee structure next, but really looking at the goals and objectives within the transportation policy plan as where we'd be addressing the transportation specific elements of a regional vision. Uh, importantly, I think what that, what that plays out for uh, with TAB is that those goals and objectives for the TPP are developed regionally. Uh, it's not a product of the council, it's a product of regional collaboration. Uh, those would be developed with our regional partners as, as we've uh, brought to you uh, items in the past, and we'll continue to do this as, as things are moving forward. Uh, we're very excited about a engagement approach that we're beginning. So uh, beginning in February, we'll be rolling that out. We have a, a trio of consultant firms assisting us with this work, and we're excited to do that both uh, collectively, uh, such as with this body, but also individually with uh, member organizations uh, around the region that have a significant stake in transportation. All right, so looking at the structure uh, in a bit more detail, um, the council has formed a transportation policy plan advisory work group. So you see that in one of the red boxes here, uh, part and parcel of that is a technical working group related to the TPP. So this builds upon an existing structure uh, for the tab of a ped bike and transit working group that is uh, reporting up to the TAC subcommittees as well as the TAC and then over to the, to the tab. Importantly, the TPP advisory group is advising the council on uh, plan development, but also has a connection to the tab. Uh, many, many members of the advisory group are TAB members, and uh, thank you for serving uh, both bodies uh, to those of, uh, those of you who are, but there are other members as well. Uh, and so, you know, having that, that relationship in place is important. So the advisory group provides policy uh, advice to the council staff as TPP uh, content is developed. Uh, as well as uh, the function of coordinating with the regional development guide as it's progressing. So uh, providing those recommendations, giving work direction to the technical work group, and then uh, identifying the significant issues to be brought to the tab and to the council for a deeper policy discussion as it arises. Um, so really the intent is to uh, prepare to engage in depth on these regional planning uh, topics uh, as they're progressing. So uh, this slide has a lot of acronyms on it, which I know are hard to read, um, but really is meant to represent just the numerous advisory boards, boards and groups at the council. Staff and members have recently consulted, including related to equity, transportation, land use, water resources, and parks. Our engagement will continue to broaden this year as we start to engage on as Charles said, the transportation policy plan development and our other policy work across the council. The TPP working group has already provided significant input into this process, and that has been documented and shared with you as part of the posting for today's meeting um, in that memo that's uh, posted on the agenda today. Last week, we had a work session with the Metropolitan Council to consider some draft vision statement language based on input that we've already uh, garnered from all of the numerous uh, uh, alphabet soup uh, groups that you see on this board today. 
much of the input uh, to date ranges from values to vision to proposals for specific policies and, and down in the weeds and desired outcomes as well. This input is helping to inform the vision and we intend to carry forward those more specific ideas and input into that policy work and strategy and action work as we continue um, to get deeper into uh, the policy chapters and even some of the additional land use work that we do at the council. Now I'd like to turn to themes around values that have emerged from our engagement thus far. We're defining values as core beliefs or principles that will guide our work. Our engagement to date strongly reflects equity principles, and that includes acknowledging past harms, repairing that harm, and building authentic relationships, and involving communities as leaders and partners in the future in our region. An example of input from the, ten, the TPP advisory work group was the suggestion to prioritize the removal of barriers to accessibility, for example. We have also heard about the importance of collaborative and innovative leadership, including with our partner agencies and organizations, and including those who might experiment and take risks. An example of input from the TPP advisory work group is that research and technology should drive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, enhance efficiency, and increase and increase accessibility and reliability. Transparency, effectiveness, and accountability have also been articulated, underscoring our desire uh, to ensure that we are effective in our work and able to correct early if we are not. And finally, participants have acknowledged the reality that our collective resources, including financial, infrastructure, and natural, are limited and should be protected and respected for future generations. Significant cross-cutting issues have emerged as a result of our engagement uh, to date as well. The council has endorsed naming a focused set of cross-cutting issues to structure, guide, and simplify the, the development of the regional development guide. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, equity is a frequent topic of discussion, and we have some of the worst racial disparities in the nation. It is a significant issue that affects the well-being of our communities and the potential of our regional economy. The Regional Development Guide is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, will likely envision the transformation, transformation of these inequities through various means, including but not limited to transportation. Climate is another obvious issue that we are addressing, not just through this engagement, but through the numerous other uh, plans and activities that the council has undertaken over the last several years, even outside of the regional development guide process. We hear, hear frequently about the importance of climate and many questions in our public comment periods about what are we doing around climate, whether it's in our parks, on climate adaptation, or adapting our wastewater resources, or even BMT reduction, which I know comes up frequently, even in conversations that I'm a part of as a land use planner at the council. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, our vision around climate will likely include leadership on mitigation and adaptation, and specific from uh, input from the Transportation Advisory Work Group supports the region investing in technologies and services toward these ends. Natural systems, including our regional parks and water resources, are also significant assets that in some cases are shared equitably, inequitably, or could be under stress. The TPP advisory work group sees the potential for the region to plan transportation systems and right away in ways that better protect, enhance, or in some cases restore natural systems. And finally, the fourth cross-cutting issue is public health, safety, and well-being. You've had significant discussion today on this very topic. Um, <clears throat> But we also know that people face disparate risks when not just using transportation, but the health and well-being of our communities has been shaped by past decision making. The work group um, also recognized the importance of safety on the transportation system, as well as how transportation supports our regional economy. So related to this, um, we've gotten some great input already. So the uh, this work has been brought before, you know, not just TAB before, but also the TPP advisory work group. Um, as Lisa mentioned, there are some examples of that. At the most recent meeting, uh, we reviewed our approach and provided uh, members of, really a synopsis of prior input and how it fits into this. So I think one of the, one of the objectives will be to uh, reshare what we had heard from input, and then hopefully it's also reflected as the, as the content itself is uh, continuing forward. Uh, so the advisory work group was very engaged. Uh, as you might expect, you know, st stakeholder input can be very detailed. Uh, some of the input might not be so much a vision level. It might be more in the goal or policy or implementation level. 
but uh, there are good examples that we can draw upon. So, um, you know, some of the strategies we can, we can integrate within the plan. Other cases, you know, I think we heard of examples, examples and success stories uh, that we want to integrate within this work and really illustrate what a, what a concept or a goal is getting at. Uh, so all of the input is useful, and we're working on documenting it in ways. You can see the attachment in, in your packet uh, repeats a lot of the, the things that we heard. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want you know, the language to uh, be what uh, the input, uh, the, the parties providing input expect and recognize, and uh, for that to be clear and focused direction to us as we're continuing work, both on the development guide and on the TPP. So the council is considering language to articula articulate the region around the uh, regional vision around the four cross-cutting issues, and we are working to ensure that the language touches upon a variety of topic considerations. First, the regional vision will consider how to integrate the cross-cutting issues, ensuring that they're woven throughout and not just standalone topics. Second, the regional vision will address different aspects of orderly and economical regional development including growth management, housing, commerce and industry, uh, parks and open space, and our water resources. And third, the council is responsible for regional systems that are integral in managing the orderly and economical development of the region. We'll integrate aspects of those systems, which, as I mentioned before, include transportation, uh, wastewater, and regional parks. And finally, we'll keep in mind a set of contextual issues to weave in as appropriate, which have also been the subject of ongoing conversation. Uh, and these are across all of our work, not just here in transportation, but you may see some of those themes um, even just today in your conversation from accessibility and affordability to shared economic prosperity to creating welcoming and inclusive places and environments. And finally, I wanna emphasize two additional sets of considerations. We will keep in mind the following work that will inform the vision, including the value language and terms uh, that we use, insights from our review of local comprehensive plans. That is the basis for our work in this region. Uh, local governments have done a significant amount of work already updating their plans through 2040 and identifying their local visions. This provides a wealth of information both on what's important to local governments, but also what issues local governments are facing that might be themes or shared across the region. We also gain a lot of insights and ideas from our advisory committees and, of course, staff ideas and suggestions and working with partners to implement the plan and how different future scenarios might impact the region. And finally, the insights we get from future stakeholder engagement that we'll be beginning to conduct this year will certainly reshape or refine some of the language that we develop at this time. So we consider this vision and values to be a, a draft, a working draft to get us started that we will continue to work and refine over the course of our uh, uh, engagement and planning over this next year or two. And I want to end with this anchoring principle, and we're using this term anchor to ensure that we're not too abstract or esoteric in our language, but that we frequently refer to the people, the community, and the places uh, that we're planning for within this region, um, including the places that communities identify um, as being important to them. So just to close up, uh, this is where we're at in the uh, vision and values conversation, not in the overall regional development guide. That's a much longer process. Um, but today, uh, being at the Transportation Advisory Board, but we will be returning to the Council's Committee of the Whole on February 1st, uh, taking the input and, and feedback that we've received from a number of different committees, including our council members from our last engagement, to provide a revised working draft for their consideration, and then additional uh, continuing uh, regional development goals conversation in February 15th at the Committee of the Whole of the Council as well. And with that, I hope that wasn't too fast. I know I speak fast, but also happy to stand for any questions you might have. We've lost a few, but questions. Go ahead, uh, Member uh, Bradley Dent. Yes, I was wondering, um, for the list, I didn't see EAP, so the Transportation Equity um, Advisory Policy Group. And so I was wondering, um, because I'm one of the co-chairs, and it seems like that they can provide some good suggestions on equity in the transportation in the seven county area, um, in areas that need attention. And I was wondering, is that information coming from um, a Met Council representative, or how is that information going to be filtered to your committee? Uh, great question. I believe it'll be uh, bring 
brought forward, and the, you know we'll we'll be looking for ways to integrate that um, specifically as we're as we're moving through. Okay. Other questions or comments? We look forward to hearing the update after after this. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are actually a little bit over time, but we didn't do too bad today. We got through all the, the entire agenda. Um, is there any um, burning tab members items that we need to at least let anybody know before we go? Otherwise, um, uh, there's no other business. I will call us adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for staying to the end, those who could. Appreciate it.